United Methodist Church on this beautiful, beautiful spring morning. Don't know if you all, I just have one question. Is everybody's foot moving? Is there a reason why your foot was moving? We thank you, gentlemen and lady. Wonderful. I'm fortunate I get to listen to this twice. It's very good. Um, well, welcome. And uh, before we get started, let's go ahead and do our uh, mission statement. God calls us to go, grow, and glorify. Go make disciples, grow in love, and glorify God. A few announcements this morning. Uh, the uh, first announcement, uh, Bill Heisman's funeral will be at 2 today in the church. Uh, there have been some requests. Uh, people want to know if there's a donation, if you want to help uh, with uh his service, uh, and you want to just make the check out to the Lewisburg United Methodist Church. Uh, pancake tickets. Kylie Criddle is walking the aisle. There is an announcement of, on the 28th uh, at Applebee's in the morning, all you can eat pancakes if you either show up or whatever or buy a ticket from Kylie. All the money goes, or $5 goes to the trip to Belize. Also, there is no huddle tonight. Uh, the Bible study at Rick and Sherry's for tonight is not going to happen, but it will uh, reconvene next week uh, on the 15th at 5 p.m. Um, Together Tuesday's back on track this week. And are there other announcements that I failed to mention or didn't make the bulletin? Okay, hearing none, let's uh, spend a couple minutes in Christian fellowship. Introit first, uh, not to discount our choir in any way, and it is my fault, not Carrie's.
And let's all stand for our um, hymn, or opening hymn. <laughs> seated as we call our hearts to worship. Sometimes you grow up singing a hymn and you're so, it's so familiar to you that sometimes it's fun to do it a different way so that you might, those words might stand out to your spirit again. So I'm going to be using a hymn from page 380 if you want to read along in your hymn book. And every now and again, I'm going to ask you to sing the chorus with us um, as we read through the hymn called There's Within My Heart, a Melody. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers, sweet and low, Fear not, I am with thee. Peace, be still, in all of life's ebb and flow. Though sometimes he leads through waters deep, trials fall across the way. Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep, see his footprints all the way. Jesus, Jesus, he's coming back to welcome me far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high.
now could we have our children join Faith down front for a moment, children's moment. Is, so let's get the younger ones a chance to look at this picture and see if they know what it is. And then if they can't figure it out, I'll ask one of the older ones, okay? What is that a picture of? A cocoon. Yeah, don't say it again. A cocoon. Right. Does it look like there's anything alive in there? It, no. Well, we know that there is, but we, it doesn't look like it too much, does it? What color is it? brown it, it's just kind of dry looking doesn't look like anything really is happening is it but you guys know from school it is spring you're right and so this looks like nothing's happening and so do you remember the Easter story that after Jesus died he was put in a tomb and his friends all the people who loved him they were so sad because it looked like nothing was happening it looks like Jesus was dead, and all of their hopes and their dreams, they were just, oh, they were just so very, very, very sad. But something was happening, wasn't it? And we know that three days later, Jesus rose from the dead, but they didn't know that. And sometimes in our lives, it can look like nothing's happening, like everything is sad, but God is some, doing something, and sometimes he doesn't show us till later. So what happens to this cocoon is... Right. We have a beautiful butterfly that emerges from the cocoon. And it is blue. I like blue butterflies, don't you? And so just like this butterfly emerged from the cocoon, Jesus came out of the grave alive. He was victorious over death. He triumphed over all the problems, all the sins, all the sad things. And that gives us hope because we can believe in him and then we can have that same victory and that happiness. Okay? So let's pray and thank God for that. Thank you, God, that even in nature you're always showing us who you are. And thank you that even when it looks like you're not doing anything, something is happening. And we can put our hope and our trust in you because you raised Jesus from the dead and you are victorious over sin. Thank you so much for that. We love you. Amen.
have a challenge for you. Try not to tap your foot while that's playing. <laughs> Amen. Thank you guys for being here. Amen. This is the time of service. We'll lift up a few prayer requests and uh, some uh, joys. And uh, if you have one that you'd like to make known public, please, uh, this is a good time to share that. I do want to share with you at 2 o'clock is uh, Bill Heinzman's service of life and resurrection here today uh, at this place. Visitation will start immediately after. And in lieu of flowers, I, I, would, I, don't, I may have been mentioned already, uh, uh, families ask for donations toward the services. So uh, would be uh, would be helpful. Also, next Saturday at 1 o'clock here at this church, John McCoy's Service of Life and Resurrection will be here uh, in remembrance of John and uh, remember him and his family. Uh, Becky Tallman had surgery last night, uh, took off a, a thumb, and uh, Becky's, Becky's a very sick girl, remember her. And also Luke Stone, a uh, young man in uh, women's and children's in, in uh, Charleston, uh, in, in dire, serious circumstances. And also Andrew Adwell in, uh, down in Memphis, uh, remember him, that little 12-year-old still needs our prayers. Are there others that would like to make? Yeah, yes. Brent Jones. Brent Jones. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Do okay. Vic, are you? Okay, Vic. Thank you, Vic. Aaron, are there others? Yeah, Scarlett. Eleanor Smith, Fred's uh, sister, died Tuesday. Bland Street, United Methodist Church, uh, on the 21st. Well, at what time? At noon. Okay. Yeah, Diane. Okay, thank you. Bill Slate, a former pastor at this church, would have had to have been in the 60s, I imagine. 70s? 80s. 80s. Oh, okay. I stand corrected. <laughs> All right. Hey, any, are there others? Yeah, Melinda. Melinda's granddaughter, expectant mother. Okay, okay, I, I hear you. Hey, hey, man, are there others? A horse, a horse accident in Ohio. Okay, and also remember uh, Rich Humes. Uh, he he, I won't say collapsed, but he he was something was wrong with him. Ambulance came to to get him uh, first service, and uh, so pray for Rich and Cheryl and that family. I don't I haven't got a report yet. They're supposed to let me know something soon. Are there others? Unspoken request, I know we have some in this standing there, urgent need. I know we've got some surgeries coming up pretty soon and uh, uh, not to be made public, but we'll remember those. Let's, uh, let's be in an attitude of prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Father, it's been a joyful place to be on this winter-like day in spring. 
It's been a joyous place to enjoy the music from Stony Bottom. It's been a joyous place to hug each other, to love on each other, to just to recognize the Spirit of God in this place. Thank you, Jesus, for, for loving us and passing that love to us that we might share uh, with a hurting world. Father, for those that we've called out by name, you know every need. You, uh, in your wisdom and in your almighty power, God can touch and anoint and make whole mind, body, and soul in every case. Pray especially for those that have lost loved ones this past week and uh, for the services of, re of resurrection and life. We, we pray your anointed presence that those can be uh, led to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through those events. So in all that we do and say through the remainder of this service, we give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's take a few moments for our meditative scripture this morning. This morning, I thank God that we've been blessed to have, to give to God, to give to God's work and to give as the kingdom of God flourishes in our midst. To God be the glory. Let's uh, join together in our offertory prayer. You are the God who creates us.
shine. But God, who called me here below, will be Please stand, if able, for the gospel reading from the 16th chapter of Mark, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. We are looking, you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. May God add his blessings to these words of Holy Scripture. Please be seated. Here we are the second Sunday of Easter, still celebrating the fact that Jesus arose from the grave. It was early one morning, I was called to St. Mary's Hospital where uh, Pauline and Anna Faye's mother lay. Uh, she was up in her 90s and in ICU and she was very near death. And uh, uh, Pauline was sitting with her mother and Anna Faye was out in, the, out in the waiting room waiting on what may happen in the next little bit. Well, just about the time I walked in the room, within seconds, uh, Mama flatlined. So Mama was essentially gone. She was a, DNA, a DNR, so they didn't, they didn't even try to resuscitate her. And I called for the nurse, and sure enough, the nurse said, well, it looks like she's, she's gone. And uh, Anna Faye come in, the other daughter, who, who was probably in her 60s, uh, came in, and about the time she come up, and she was so grief-stricken that she literally fell across her mother, uh, just, just right on her midsection, fell across her mother in tears. Well, Mama woke up, <laughs> and and uh, I believe what what essentially happened that Mama was resuscitated, or essentially a CPR version uh, was resuscitated by the fact that somebody jumped on her lungs. And uh, she lived about a month or so after that, not a real good quality of life or anything, a pretty rough month. However, it did allow time for the family to say their goodbyes in a much more orderly fashion. Over the years, it's happened a few times when people were declared dead and they woke up. And the truth of the matter is they were just mistaken. It was just a, it was just a mistake. If, if they actually were revived, then they weren't really dead anyway. It would have just been a tragic mistake. Except, of course, one notable exception. That exception took place in a tomb out just outside of Jerusalem. The accounts vary somewhat differently depending on which gospel version you read. It's the first day of the week. The Sabbath has passed and three women are coming according to Mark's account. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and, and Salome. They had brought spices that they might anoint this body and, and kind of bring some, a sense of closure to their grief. And he was a friend that, that had been fr crucified the preceding Friday. Two days had passed. Their hearts were heavy. As they come closer to the tomb, they wonder to themselves, who is going to roll away this big heavy stone? The stone that sealed the tomb was very large and it didn't move very easily. 
But to their amazement, when they got there, the stone was rolled away and the guards lay like they were dead over to the side and entered the tomb. They found a young man dressed in white and they were scared. They were frightened. The young man said, don't be afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified, but I say to you today, he is risen, he is not here. Go tell the disciples and Peter to go and meet, we'll meet in Galilee, and there you shall see him. And he said unto you, thus was fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, who wrote hundreds of years before in chapter 25 of Isaiah, he will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord will wipe away the tears from our faces. Death has been swallowed up in victory. The essential message of, e of, of Easter this morning is that death has died. We are here to celebrate the fact that death is no longer, de no longer defeats us. Death was defeated. So we celebrate the death of death. The final enemy has been conquered. We as a society have been removed from death in some ways. For generations past, death was even a much more of a reality on a daily basis. For one thing, our lifespans were much shorter. The average lifespan was much shorter, about half of what it is now. Fatal diseases were often epidemic. Many, if not most, families would lose at least one child before the child was raised. People died at home, not, not hidden away in a hospital room somewhere. Death was very much more real than it is for us today. It was common on the farm that if something didn't die, we didn't eat. It was common to kill a chicken on Saturday for Sunday's dinner. Today, we're experts at both denying and delaying our own mortality. Many children born this year will probably live to be 100 years old. We delay dying. Now, if we could just solve the problem of aging, told the story earlier about the man selling eternal youth pills. He was going around telling people he promised to his customers they would never grow old. And the police came and arrested the man. And he was booked at the police station as they began to check his record and found that he had been arrested in 1776, 1812, and 1903 for the same charges. Just kidding. We live in a hedonistic culture. People dread aging. I've, I've seen people in my life, I've had a couple in my own family, but I, I remember one particular neighbor, when she turned 50 years old, I thought she was going to literally lose her mind. She had been a very, very beautiful woman her whole life, and, and you know people that are beautiful get old just like people that are not beautiful. And so everybody gets old, and, and yet science is rapidly placing upon us the intolerable burden of Titanius. Titanius was a, a Greek legend, a Greek, a Greek uh, uh, a story that tells about, uh, it's a mythological story. Uh, Aurora, who was the goddess of dawn, she fell in love with Titanius. Titanius was a mortal youth. In other words, he would die like all the other humans. Well, Zeus was the king of gods, and he offered Aurora the gift that she, any gift that she may choose for Titanius. Naturally, she chose the gift that he would live forever, but she forgot to ask that he stay forever young. And so Titanius grew older and older and older and could never die, and the curse became, the gift became a curse. Thus, there may be many things that we dread more than physical death. For many of us, death is far removed from our daily lives. It has no biting reality until we're brought face to face with it in our own families, in our own lives. So we may not think about death in the same way our ancestors did. However, Easter brings us to the stark reality of what death means. Not the avoidance of death. It's just that the certainty of death in Easter, we are given hope because Christ lives, we can live. What great news is that? Easter is a tonic for the soul. It helps us lift our eyes from our problems to our possibilities. I want you to hear that this morning. Easter allows us to take our eyes off of ourselves and our problems and, and lift them up to the possibilities of what God may have for us. 
As I've said often, we operate in a land of, of two choices. We have plan A or plan B, and God always comes up with plan C that we didn't see coming. And plan C is always better than either plan A or B. So instead of telling God how big our problems are, I would suggest to you this morning, as you brought problems into this, into this place this morning, as you come in with a burden, a personal burden, a burden in your family, something that you're dealing with personally, you bring it into this place, I would urge you, instead of telling God how big your problems are, I would say, tell your problems how big your God is. Amen? Amen. We have a God that can. We have a God that's able. We have a God that's willing to meet your needs, whatever they are. So instead of being drawn down by your problems and become inward focused, we become outward focused in who God is and take our eyes off of our problems. We begin to tell our problems how big our God is. Or the Apostle Paul says it like this. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, and whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. When we focus on me and mine, and it'll get you down every time. When you see somebody that's inward focused, you see somebody that's in trouble. Actually, I have a name for that. I call it hell. That's what hell looks like in our personal lives. When you become focused on you and yours and everything concerning you and the whole world is out to get you, that's living in hell. That's what it looks like and that's what it feels like. So, so you, you can have a little ache, you have a little pain, and you get so focused and, 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 and you know, these doctors love No, they don't love it. I'm just kidding. But I'm, I'm saying they love it when people Google their problems. You know, everybody knows what Google is, right? You look it up, and you sit there and start reading your symptoms, and all, all at once you go from an ingrown toenail to, to you've got two-day-old cancer that you're going to die tomorrow, get the funeral home on schedule, you're ready to go. By the time you get through reading all that stuff, like the fellow who went to the doctor, he had self-diagnosed, he had Googled his problems, and he went to the doctor with all the answers. The doctor listened to him and said, I'll give you a prescription. This is the first time I've ever given you any medicine, but you take this. But you're in a bad way. Has he folded the prescription and handed it to him? Took it to his pharmacist. Pharmacist handed it back. I can't, I can't feel this. The man looked at it, and, and the doctor had written, go walk eight miles and go home and eat a big steak and quit reading things you ought not read. <laughs> it's dangerous to focus on yourself. It's dangerous to live your life inward focused. You begin to feel sorry for yourself. We see the very joy of Easter is that we are able to lift past our problems into our possibilities of what God may do. Look up and don't look down. Because he lives, I can live. We can face life head on with the confidence of not that I'm so big and bad or you're so, or you're so able. I have no confidence in any of you or me. My confidence is in the God of the universe. My confidence is in the one that defeated death, hell, and the grave and come out victorious that I might have life and have it abundantly. Or in the words of Lynn Anderson, I beg your pardon. I never promised you a rose garden. Along with the sunshine, there's got to be a little rain sometimes. Our lives are not always roses and sunshine. There's thorns and there's thunderstorms. But Easter is God's promise to us, however, that neither life nor death can conquer us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. We need to hear that this morning. Whatever you brought into this place, you need to understand that you've got a God that's able to deal with whatever you're facing. Easter is hope. Easter is God's affirmation of God's goodness and God's grace. But one thing more needs to be said. Easter is God's affirmation that, that Christ lives with us daily, that he walks with us. He takes us by the hand and guides us daily. We share in the joy of Mary Magdalene and Peter and all those disciples to whom the risen Christ appeared. We share in that joy we can't contain it any longer. We're filled with his power and filled with his life. For you see, he lives. You ask me how I know he lives. Well, he lives in my heart. And I know that. And that, of course, 
is the meaning of Easter. Death has been conquered. We can lift our eyes off of our problems and look at the possibilities. Christ is alive, and because he lives, you can live also. No wonder Easter is so special. It's not a denial of the power of death, but a marvelous, victorious affirmation of life that God has for us. Christ is alive, and because he lives, we get to live too. To move from our problems to the glorious possibilities that God has for us. Let's bow our heads just for a moment. Thank you, Jesus, for your power, for the glory of the Lord in this place. I pray for that one individual here this morning that brought a terrible burden with him this morning. Maybe they're anxious about something that's, that's, that they're facing. Maybe they're anxious about something in their family, their relationship issues. Whatever they brought to the table this morning, I pray for the glory of the Lord to surround them. Father, I pray that they move from the problems to the possibilities that you would have for each and every one of them. So God, in Jesus' name, answer their prayer. Help them to see past the problem into the glorious future of an almighty God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As you're able, let's stand and sing our prayer, our hymn of response. <laughs> words of benediction as we go from this place to declare to the world he lives he lives forevermore amen, amen.